Kristen Atchison here, and we are talking about therapies for our Introduction to Psychology course. Um, today we're going to talk about kind of the overview of the kinds of therapies, um, and then we're going to focus in on psychotherapy. So, therapies are um, around to relieve suffering of individuals with psychological disorders. So, we just previously talked about psychological disorders. This is kind of the other side of the coin. Um, this is how we, how we treat, um, how we relieve the suffering of those with psychological disorders. There's two main approaches that we're going to talk about. The first is the psychological approach. Um, this involves things like psychotherapies that we're going to talk about today on this video. Um, these are non-medical interventions. Um, they include things like clinical and counseling psychologists. They include things like social workers um, are, are taking this psychological approach um, to psychological disorders. Now, the other part of the other approach we can take is the biological approach. And this includes things like biomedical therapies, especially drug therapies. There are others um, that we'll talk about in class. Um, but, and these are pre primarily treated through either a psychiatrist or other healthcare professional, other um, doctor, MD, DO that has prescribing um, powers. In fact, a lot of medications are actually not prescribed by psychiatrists, but are prescribed uh, by, their, by the individual's general, pra general practitioner. And then finally, we'll also talk about in class the so social cultural approach. Um, and this is really looking at the individual as a part of a system. And this will include things like group therapies and couples therapy and family therapy, um, those looking at how to treat these psychological disorders from that perspective. So regardless of the kind of therapy um, someone is receiving, the goals of it are the same. Um, to increase overall psychological fu functioning, to reduce inappropriate or destructive behaviors, and to better understand oneself and others. And this is kind of a breakup of kind of who provides therapy. We see that about 41% um, percent, um, of therapies for psychological disorders are, are, are administered by physicians. And this will include psychiatrists, but again, also general practitioners as well. We see about um, 38% um, being done by mental health specialists. These will be those clinical psychologists, the counseling psychologists, um, the social workers, these kinds of individuals. And then we have um, a, about 20% is being provided by other professionals. This will include clergy, um, religious um, leaders, things like that. So there's four kinds that we're going to talk about, kinds of therapists that we're going to talk about. The first is a psychologist. Um, a psychologist has a, a clinical or counseling psychologist holds a doctorate in psychology um, and is trained in psychological testing, evaluation, diagnosis, but also in psychotherapy, research, prevention of mental health and emotional disorders. So at the beginning of this class, I told you I'm not that kind of psychologist, and this is the kind of psychologist I'm talking about. Um, I also have a doctorate in psychology, but I have a, a, an academic degree. Um, so my degree was in developmental psychology, and it was directed at um, teaching and research. And so a clinical or counseling psychologist is going to go through a completely different kinds of program um, while we'll both go through research and we'll both go through um, different kinds of education. Um, we, um, the counseling or clinical psychologists are really going to have a lot of their education and training focused on the testing, evaluation, diagnosis, um, and psychotherapy. A psychiatrist, um, again, is that MD or DO that holds that medical degree. Um, this person has expertise in diagnosis and treatment and prevention, but that treatment is going to be pro primarily biomedical. So we're going to, this is going to be primarily um, a, um, again, a, a medical therapy. And sometimes that could include, again, psychosurgery or um, other kinds of treatments as well. Um, this is who has the, the authority to prescribe medications and other medical procedures. And so sometimes we'll see a psychologist and a psychiatrist will work together. Um, when I was a mental health caseworker before I went to graduate school, um, oftentimes our clients had um, the psychiatrist that worked at the office that I was out of. Um, they had clinical psychologists as well. Um, and then kind of where I fell, um, kind of um, was a little bit below social worker. Um, and social workers really focus on assisting people in difficult situations such as poverty, family conflict, abuse, homelessness 
homelessness. Um, this, for a therapist, is going to have a master's level degree in social work, um, an MSSW. Um, and these people can provide the same diagnostic and treatment services as a clinical psychology, except they're going to be less likely to be trained in those psychological testings. So they're kind of approaching it from a different way. Um, again, there are social workers that aren't, don't have this kind of um, master's level um, and still work with the individual on assisting people with difficult situations such as poverty, family conflict, abuse, and homelessness. And so that was kind of the role that I took um, as a mental health um, professional. Um, and then finally, we have counselors, um, and a professional counselor holds, again, a master's level degree in counseling and has expertise in assessment and counseling. Um, they've got different therapy techniques, um, and they're more likely than other disciplines to really give attention to kind of um, a little bit more of a well-rounded um, kind of perspective, this kind of whole person perspective. Look at spirituality, education, professional well-being, and we're also going to see that counselors are really going to focus on prevention as well as treatment. So somebody that has an LPC, a licensed professional counseling um, certification, would be somebody that has this. Again, they have master's level work done, um, depending on um, that there's various different master's level works that you can go to to get this LPC. Um, but again, all of these require graduate work. Um, so we either have um, master's level work with a social worker or counselor, we have um, doctorate work at a psychologist, um, or an MD and a psychiatrist. So types of therapy, again, there's the two main ones that we're going to talk about. Um, today in this lecture, we're going to talk about psychotherapy, which is, again, this treatment of emotional, behavioral, and interpersonal problems through psychological techniques. So this is going to be kind of think about the things that we've talked about in psychology. We've talked about cognition. We've talked about emotion. We've talked about arousal. We've talked about behavior. Um, these are going to be those kinds of things. Um, these are going to be trying to solve and trying to help reduce suffering um, for someone with a psychological disorder from the psychological perspectives. Biomedical therapy we're going to talk about in class, and these are the use of medications or other medical treatments to relieve those symptoms associated with psychological disorders. Okay, so that's kind of our overview, and we're going to move into psychotherapy now. So in terms of the effectiveness of psychotherapy, we're going to talk about four different kinds of therapy here in this lecture today. Um, there are other kinds, but we're going to talk about four. Um, but what's important to remember before we talk about any of them is that the, all therapies are winners. Um, I used to tell... Um, my clients as um, a mental health caseworker that um, that really everybody can benefit from therapy. Um, you, these individuals were just lucky and had the state willing to pay for it for them. Um, and so again, all therapies are winning. All therapies can have been, um, can have be beneficial. Um, and these are really evidence-based practices. This isn't something um, that somebody's like, oh, I have an idea. I'm going to try this and see if it works. Um, this is evidence-based practice means that there's been rigorous research into these various techniques. Um, and again, this research then um, impacts the training of the people going through these graduate programs to be, um, to be therapists. Um, there's various factors in terms of successful psychotherapy, um, the therapeutic alliance, um, the therapist's expertise and personality, and the active client engagement. And as we'll talk about later on, um, really having a good match between the therapist and the client, um, really having that, um, that connection is going to be really, really important. Um, and so we'll see um, both a match in terms of of this, um, this you know, this therapeutic alliance, this um, this connection, this um, this connect relationship between the therapist and the client um, is going to be really, really important. But aspects of that relationship are going to be important too. Um, so whether um, the there's a cultural match between the therapist and um, the client, and that doesn't mean that they have to be from the same culture, um, but they have to be well versed enough in that culture um, to be able to understand the cultural perspectives that they're coming from. Um, the same thing with gender. We don't necessarily have to have a gender match, but be well versed enough in the differences in gender perspectives um, to really have this, um, this healthy relationship and be able to look 
look at things from different perspectives. Um, and so we'll see that these are really, really helpful. But as you can see from this graph, um, we see that 70, well, more than 70% of people are improved with um, psychotherapy um, as opposed to um, a placebo, which is less than 40%, and no treatment, which is less than 20%. So again, we do see that all therapies um, are beneficial um, and can be helpful in treating psychological disorders. So the four main therapies that we're going to talk about today um, are psychodynamic therapies, humanistic therapies, behavior therapies, and cognitive therapies. Now, once again, there are more kinds of therapies out there. These are just the four that we're going to focus on in this class. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is psychodynamic therapies. Um, and really, um, these therapies came out of psychoanalysis with Freud. Um, and psychodynamic is kind of the, the, the newer way that we talk about these, the more contemporary way we talk about these. Um, in this approach, there's an emphasis on early childhood experiences, as you would guess from um, anything that you've kind of seen or read about Freud. Um, and we also see that unconscious conflicts are going to be a big um, piece of this. Um, there's also a lot of therapeutic interpretation um, in these um, um, therapies that's a little bit different than some other therapies. So this interpretation is going to be this kind of search for symbolic or hidden meanings and what the client's saying um, and does during um, during the therapy session. So again, this is going to be a little different than some of the other therapies. This is um, where there's supposed to be this kind of, the therapist has um, this kind of, um, again, this search for these hidden meanings that things necessarily aren't on face value because of these unconscious conflicts. The goal of the therapy is to identify the sources of these unconscious conflicts so that they can be addressed. And in these contemporary psychodynamic um, therapies, we see that, again, this interpretation of hidden feelings and memories through, um, but we also see that there's more of a collaborative process and dialogue um, than we saw in kind of um, Freud's time. So we do see more of a back and forth and not just this, just this um, psychoanalyst interpretation of it. And we also see that psychodynamic ther therapies tend to be more short-term based and are focused on really specific problems, um, especially social relationships we'll see um, is where psychodynamic theories really kind of have their stronghold. The next theory that we're going to talk about is humanistic therapies. Um, these really focus on the present rather than the past. Um, so this is going to be different than those psychodynamic therapies. And they also emphasize conscious rather than unconscious thoughts. Again, this is going to be very different um, from those psychodynamic therapies. We didn't cover um, the psychodynamic um, perspective and the humanistic perspective in um, our personality chapter because we didn't cover personalities. Um, but humanistic um, theory really is kind of a backswing, um, a pendulum swing from, um, from these psychodynamic theories. So psychodynamic theory is really focused on, on these unconscious things. They kind of focus on really negative behaviors. And we see that humanistic therapies um, really, and humanistic theory kind of the pendulum swing the other way and we had this really, really um, big focus on the present, on these conscious things, responsibility for one's um, feelings. And instead of looking at those really negative things, humanistic therapies really look at this inherent potential for self-fulfillment and growth. So think of Maslow and his self-actualization. Um, this is that kind of perspective that humanistic therapies are taking, um, this kind of self-fulfillment, um, this kind of growth. In humanistic therapies, we see, um, again, these conscious thoughts in the present. We see a lot of self-healing and self-fulfillment um, focused in this kind of an approach. Um, and the goals of the therapy are really self-understanding and personal growth. So these are going to be different than psychodynamic theories that really, or psychodynamic therapies that really looked at the psychoanalyst interpreting the hidden meanings of what the client's saying. The goal of this therapy is really that the individual is gaining understanding about themselves. This, um, some of this research came out of Rogers, client-centered therapy, um, and he discussed this as um, this non-directive self-exploration. He said that it should be a warm and supportive environment that had three components that were really important for there to be this self, this self-exploration that was not directive. Um, non-directive is again a, a kind of a swing back from those psychodynamic theories when um, the psychoanalyst is interpreting um, what the individual is saying. That's very directive, right? That's that that. It, 
that interpretation is taking you down a particular path. Um, we're in non-directive self-exploration. We're going to have a lot more freedom from the client themselves to kind of explore, not necessarily in a directed path. And so again, he says that we need to have this warm and supportive atmosphere. And these three characteristics include genuineness, um, include acceptance, which Roger called unconditional um, positive regard that we'll talk about a little bit um, more, and this empathy too. So we really had to have this really kind of um, really healthy, open, welcoming environment um, for individuals to be able to um, respond in. One of the things that you see in um, in this um, directive, non-directive self-exploration is active listening and reflective speech. Um, so if you've ever watched any kind of TV program where they talk about where they're trying to demonstrate therapy, um, a lot of times what you'll see is this active listening and this reflective speech. So, you know, you'd hear the therapist say, so what I hear you saying is, and they're re reflecting that speech back at them. So kind of, you know, the the stereotypical therapy idea is really coming out um, that of that reflective speech. Um, and so this is restating and clarifying what you feel the client is saying, and it serves really two purposes. One, it shows this empathy that you're really tuning into what that individual is saying, and that's creating this warm and supportive atmosphere. But it also helps the client build awareness and acceptance of their own strengths and feelings. So sometimes when you hear your own statements reflected back at you in different words, you can kind of understand them differently, which is again what this non-directive self-exploration is looking at. The next kind of therapy that we're going to talk about is behavior therapy. Um, behavior therapy, really um, the emphasis here is that overt behavior change rather than insights into self or underlying causes. So again, we kind of have another pendulum swing here. So both the humanistic theories and um, the humanistic therapies and the psychodynamic therapies are very, very thought-based, right? They're very, very um, kind of introspective, kind of thinking about yourself, um, commenting about these internal workings, whether they're conscious or unconscious. Behavior's like, eh, no, we're just talking about behavior here. And we want to look into these kind of underlying causes of behavior. Um, so the goals of this therapy are really to reduce or eliminate mal maladaptive behaviors. And this is, again, coming out of classical and operant conditioning. Um, and so while we saw that Freud and humanistic theories um, are very um, kind of introspective and kind of thinking about oneself a lot uh, and one's inner self a lot, um, we'll see that behavior therapies are kind of a swing the other way and are looking at the individual's behavior. So we're really just looking outwardly here and um, there may be some conversation about the reasons behind that behavior, but primarily we're talking about behavior here. Um, so behavioral therapies do not seek to uh, explain psychological disorders by exploring the unconscious or promoting self-awareness or insight like you saw in psychodynamic theories and humanistic theories. What we see in behavioral theories is they assume that do any disordered behavior is learned either through operant conditioning or classical conditioning. And thus, we can relieve symptoms by kind of undoing that, by this kind of counter conditioning. Um, so we can either change the rewards and punishments that are influencing these problematic behaviors, which would be operant, operant conditioning, or we can build new associations to disrupt these unwanted associations that can cause panic or other automatic responses, which would be classical conditioning. So again, these are kind of the idea is that these, this negative behavior, this disordered behavior is learned through either operant or classical conditioning. And so to relieve that, we have to undo that learning. We have to kind of have extinction. Um, and this is the way that behavioral therapies are looking at it. Um, so there's two that we're going to talk about kind of behavioral therapies, one of which is exposure. Well, we're going to talk about exposure therapy, and we're going to talk about two kinds of exposure therapy. I apologize. Um, and again, these are counter conditionings, and we see that these can be used to treat phobias and other kinds of maladaptive behavior. Um, and what we see is in these um, classical conditioning techniques, some emotion arousing stimulus is confronted directly and repeatedly, leading to this decrease or elimination in the emotional response. Um, and that's called systematic desensitization. And this is, again, particularly for phobias. And they kind of develop this hierarchy of fearful scenes and apply relaxation while going through these 
fearful scenes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The other one is adverse conditioning, which we're going to pair an undesirable behavior with an adverse stimuli, um, with the idea is to decrease the likelihood of that, um, that behavior happening again. So in systematic desensitization, again, this is a form of counter conditioning and exposure therapy um, in which muscle relaxation is progressively combined with a fear-inducing stimuli to eliminate the triggering of unwanted arousal. So to eliminate that, that fear response. So in this example, this person's scared of spiders. Um, and so first they're shown a spider and they go through these um, kind of relaxation techniques. Um, far, and they're shown this picture far away. And then they're shown the picture close up maybe. Then they're shown a toy spider. Then they're showing a toy spider in someone's hand and then they have to hold the fake toy spider um, and then an, in, a real spider is introduced in a cage and then a real spider is introduced um, in their hand in someone's hand and then finally um, the real spider is on their own hand and so in all of these situations um, they will kind of keep going through this one scenario um, over and over and over again until we see this kind of relaxation, until we see this kind of um, calming. And then these graphs, it's being measured by the pulse rate um, per minute. Um, and so they're using this, this physiological arousal um, as an indicator of fear in this systematic desensitization. The other one that we're going to talk about is aversion therapy. Again, this is counter conditioning as well. Um, and this is where they're pairing um, a, um, an unwanted behavior with something adverse um, that makes that person less likely to engage in that behavior again. So in this situation, the unconditioned stimulus would be a nausea-inducing nausea drug. And what they'll do is they'll pair that nausea-inducing drug with whatever that maladaptive behavior is. It can be cigarettes, it can be alcohol. Um, these are a lot of times used um, for addiction kinds of therapy, but can be used for other things as well. So kind of pairing this um, this this drug or this thing that will make, will have a negative consequence. Um, and so what we see then is the people then will develop an association between alcohol and nausea, which will make the person less likely to want to drink alcohol if they have an association with alcohol and nausea. Um, so this would be an example of an aversion therapy. The last kind of therapy that we're gonna talk about is cognitive therapies. And in cognitive therapies, the emphasis is really on these these thoughts as the primary source of psychological problems. And this is especially um, used for things like anxiety and depression. Um, and the way this approach looks is that if we can control how we think, um, then we can control how we feel. Um, that if we can control these illogical patterns of thinking, um, then we can change how we feel about them. And it really focuses on two different things, irrational beliefs and cognitive distortions. Um, and this was really focusing on overt problems, which is very different than what Freud and the psychodynamic theory were doing. Um, so while this is looking internally, it's still very different than what Freud did. It also really has this structured analysis and specific guidance, which is very different than Rogers and his non-directive um, guidance. And so again, here we're kind of trying to undo negative thinking patterns. Um, so the goals of therapy are this cognitive restructuring, restructuring, recognizing and altering these unhealthy patterns of thoughts so that we can change um, these, um, these psychological problems, these psychological disturbances. Beck was one of the major proponents of this theory, um, and he says that really we distort experiences and maintain negative views about ourselves, and this causes us to misattribute negative experiences to our own deficiencies. Um, and so this is what Beck is saying, that our, because we there's negative distorted thought patterns, um, and we distort experiences and have these negative views about them, that we misattribute any kind of a negative experience to one self instead of to those outside attributions. So think back to social psychology when we're talking about attribution theory. Um, and so this is saying that these are doing a lot of personal internal um, dispositional attributions. Um, and so when you have those personal attributions for negative experiences, um, there it can be cognitive um, problems. This therapy really challenges these cognitive distortions. Um, they, but, and they do this several different ways. Um, they challenge this all or none thinking, um, that things are either 
absolutely perfect or they're absolutely terrible and there's nothing in between. Obviously, as you've seen through this class, almost everything in our world and our lives are in a spectrum, right? Um, and so really affecting this head on that if, you know, if something doesn't go your way, that's not the worst thing that's ever happened. That could be bad. That could be unfortunate. Um, but it's not the end of the world. That also leads us into catastrophizing. Um, you know, if you lose an item or if you have a bad day or something doesn't go your way, that is not a catastrophe. Um, and so really addressing the uh, these negative thought patterns where people do catastrophize um, these behaviors. Discounting the positive, so having this pessimistic outlook where we put more power in these negative thoughts than we do in these positive experiences. And so really kind of flipping that and focusing on the positive. And overgeneralization. Um, so example, you know, somebody says something rude, so that person doesn't like me. Well, that's really an overgeneralization. Maybe that person was having a bad day. Maybe that person, you know, had their own life going on and has nothing to do with you. Um, so this overgeneralization would be another example of a cognitive distortion. And the treatment really focuses on reorganizing these automatic negative thoughts, such as all in thinking, catastrophizing, um, discounting the positive and overgeneralization, um, and really restructuring those to healthy um, um, beliefs. So kind of recognizing them so that they can kind of have um, a little bit more control over them. Clients are directed to empirically test whether these beliefs are true. Um, so in all or none thinking, well, is this, you know, um, this really horrible negative thing or is it somewhere different? Is this the end of the world or did I end up being okay? Um, you know, really fo like showing how the focusing on the positive can come in benefits. And so really coming to the realization that these unrealistic um, beliefs are, are really are, are not being helpful and, are, and can be the source of the problem. The last piece that we're going to talk about really kind of falls under cognitive therapy, but also behavioral therapy, and it's called cognitive behavioral therapy. And this aims not, it kind of combines both the benefits of cognitive therapy and the benefits of behavioral therapy. So this aims not only to alter the way people think, but also the way people behave. Um, since we know we have this interaction um, between thoughts and behavior, I mean, this really addresses that head on. Um, so what we think affects how we act and feel, what we do affects how we think and feel, and what we feel affects what we think and do. This kind of relationship between our thoughts, emotion, and behavior. And so what it does is it really seeks to make people aware of these irrational thinking, like we do in, like you saw in cognitive therapy, but the related behaviors to that as well, like you saw in behavioral therapy. And so it both replaces this, uh, places it with new ways of thinking, like you would see in cognitive um therapies, but we also have this behavioral component where we practice new thinking and behaviors in these everyday settings. This is therapy is often described as very problem focused, action oriented. It's very structured, very transparent, but it's flexible to the needs of the individual. And an example of this would be a, a CBT client with obsessive compulsive disorder who fears contamination in a public restroom might be instructed to visit restrooms three times a week. So they're both having to c confront those negative thoughts, those irrational thoughts um, about these bathrooms, but have a behavioral component of um, kind of uh, addressing them just like you would see in that kind of aversion therapy and uh, not the aversion therapy, the desensitization therapy. Um, so you can see both components there where we're addressing those negative thoughts and we're addressing those behaviors. The last um, kind of therapy that we're going to kind of talk about could use any of these techniques, um, but um, have kind of come out of technology. Um, and so we see that there are some other health interventions, mental health interventions, um, that can be done more electronically. Um, we see mobile health related smartphone apps are becoming um, popular. We also see that cyber therapy, which is um, a therapy session that would be done over like Skype or a webcam, um, something like that. However, not all of these companies really vet their therapists prior. Um, they do not serve suicidal patients, um, and they cannot guarantee privacy um, because of this cyber connection. However, the benefit of it is, is that it really is making therapy available to clients who may not otherwise receive it. Um, as we'll talk about 
um, or as we already talked about, um, there's a huge stigma attached to psychological disorders. Um, and so someone may not want to kind of go and receive these treatments or acknowledge these things in more open and outward ways, whereas cyber therapy allows people to kind of um, have that kind of some mental health intervention um, with, um, without having to confront the stigma. But again, if we just fix the stigma thing, that's, that's a benefit too. Um, in terms of effectiveness, um, like we said, um, the, all therapies are winners. Um, and so we see really beneficial rates of, um, of treatment. And so we see that both clients and clinicians report high rates of effective treatment. However, of course, these are going to be very subjective and so can be biased. But this, again, like we said, evidence-based research has consistently found that psychotherapy is more effective than receiving no treatment at all. Um, and so therapy is the most effective, is, is, is also found to be most effective when the problem is very clear cut and specific. So here's another graph that's looking at the success um, of psychotherapy. Um, and so here we're comparing um, participants who received psych psychotherapy versus participants who didn't. Um, and this is over, you can see um, that from the beginning, we see a 30% improval rating even after two weeks. By a year, we're at an 80% improval rating. Um, and kind of by two years, um, we're up to a 90%. So we can really see that there are these benefits of um, psychotherapy over no therapy. Um, and finally, we see that, again, as I've talked about a little bit, um, that therapeutic alliance, that um, therapeutic relationship is going to be really, really important. Um, the therapist has a huge role to play in that, that caring, empathetic responsiveness. But we also have to see that the client plays a role, too, and that motivated um, client and that optimistic client is more likely to have successful outcomes. Um, the social cultural piece of it we'll talk about more later, but we do need to see um, kind of supportive family and living situations. And again, as we talked about, that culturally sensitive therapist is going to be a compo important component as well. Um, whether that therapist be the same um, ethnicity um, or culture as the individual, or just be culturally sensitive and culturally competent um, of differences. And so we'll see that when we have that good match, um, we're going to see more successful outcomes. Thanks so much.